Hello to you, welcome back. And as promised, we're going to talk now about the development of vaccines around the world. Of course, a market dominated by Pfizer and by AstraZeneca and many others. Uh, but an important breakthrough uh, over recent days, the uh, production and application for use of new vaccines continues apace. And I'm really pleased to welcome to India Global Forum, Dr. Sharvil Patel, who's the Managing Director of Zydus. Uh, Dr. Patel, uh, welcome to India Global Forum. It's good to have you with us. Uh, just talk to me first of all about this application for the emergency use of your three-dose vaccine. Just explain a little bit about it and what this application for emergency use actually means. So thank you, uh, Ben, and thank you to the India Global Forum for uh, having me here. Uh, yes, so re yeah, yesterday we did submit our emergency use application for our DNA-based vaccine, uh, and uh, we submitted our interim data. We have obviously vaccinated, uh, done the trial on a large number of Indian population, close to 28,000 uh, volunteers. It has been tested as in a three-dose format and recently also completed the immunogenicity on the two-dose format. Uh, the good part about the vaccine is that it, is, it uses a device which is different from any other. So it is an intradermal application. And uh, we have so far seen a very good safety comparable to the placebo. So no serious or adverse events and the efficacy is about 66.6% uh, related to the current pandemic that is there in the country. And so talk to me a little bit about how this will add to the you know, armoury, the weapons that we have to fight this pandemic and where it will fit. You say that 66% um, uh, effic uh, usefulness, uh, to put it that way. Um, uh, how and why is that a, a valuable tool to add to our armory, given that we know right around the world that vaccines are clearly in high demand and in many countries, as we were discussing yesterday at the forum, there is simply a lack of availability? So there are two, three things. Uh, one of the important aspects of this trial has been that we have tested this vaccine in uh, 1,000 children and it has been found to be safe and efficacious. So the safety has already been there and very soon we will also submit the efficacy or the immunogenicity data. So the good part of this vaccine is it has covered a large number of children in the vaccination part of it. The second also is that uh, this, this vaccine can be applied multiple times uh, because of the platform and the inherent nature of the platform. So I think from the future point of view, adapting to new strains, uh, which may be necessary if, if uh, we see the kind of things that are happening. Uh, this being a nucleic acid platform is easily adaptable to the new strain. In fact, we are in the, on the verge of completing our, manu uh, our the scale up of our new uh, Delta variant as well. So I think multiple benefits there also for the children. And more importantly, I think it's going to be, it's, a, it's proven to be extremely safe uh, as what we see from now. Um, and talk to me about the global vaccine rollout. I don't know if you were able to hear our previous panel. We were speaking there to the National Health Authority in India. Uh, and of course, the vaccine rollout causing so many logistical problems in many countries around the world. How would you uh, sum up? How would you summarize the vaccine response to this pandemic around the world? And where are the particular highlights and where are the countries that are still severely lacking? So I think as you alluded to earlier, I think what the need is to have more vaccines uh, because we obviously need to vaccinate a large population both within our country and globally. But I think the critical thing that we believe that both all the manufacturers or the governments or the institutions can do is to partner to make sure we make more vaccines available equitably. I think we know that every vaccine has different uh, benefits and associated risks. But I think the need of the hour today is to make sure that we allow free vaccination to happen across the globe so that we know that this is one way of reducing the pandemic that has happened in different waves. And you know about the new variants and new waves that are getting created in different countries. So I think the first foremost thing is that we need to leave this whole discussion about which vaccine, why this vaccine. I think the, the vaccines are go through the stringent regulatory process and are approved. I think there should be an approval to give vaccination if these doses can be made available. The second is the global supply chain is very complex. It's highly interdependent on each other. So I don't think there is a room for us to think about only securing a particular way of the supply chain, but it needs to be more inclusive. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to produce a vaccine, you are reliant on multiple countries and multiple companies who help you 
do this and multiple government or institutional bodies that help you get there in terms of testing and tracing. So I think that's what we need to do better efforts on that and allowing a more free flow access to the vaccines. Um, just a year ago at this very event, we were in the midst of you know, the first and second waves. Um, the, the concept of a vaccine, a, a solution, a route out of this pandemic seemed a very distant thought. How would you sum up the response of the vaccines industry, the pharmaceutical industry, in getting us to where we are today uh, and the progress that has been made in just 12 months? So I think it truly demonstrates that in times of crisis, uh, how uh, everybody is able to come together and be able to do something at that scale. Not only obviously uh, discover and spend time on the a research side of it, but at the same time, take the risk of scaling up manufacturing and preparing for success. And while we all wish for the success, it's a very hard journey to reach success in such a thing. So I think a lot of credit goes to all the companies and the people who have who have really taken that bold step in terms of doing something in this area. And many have succeeded. And I hope more will succeed as we move forward. Yeah, so I think that's what... definitely been one great aspect of uh, the journey so far. Yeah, and, and how would you rate India's involvement? We know, of course, the Serum Institute plays such a vital role in this rollout around the world. Uh, just paint a picture of India's involvement and India's role in this global response. So I do believe that in the long term, vaccines have to have affordability and access. Only then we can continue to immunize a large part of the world. You know, on every immunization program, that is super critical. So I believe Indian companies do have that capability to scale up manufacturing and innovate. Today we have at least eight vaccines uh, which are either approved or under development. So India will definitely play a very important role in the overall vaccine rollout. And we do believe that the vaccines will be something, at least for the COVID, will be something that we need to look at on an annual basis, whether we need a, re a booster shot or we need to produce more for the new strains. So I think India will play an, an important role there. And I believe we will have significant scale of manufacturing uh, and new technologies, not only a single technology, but at least four to five different technology vaccines that will definitely be made available to both for the country and obviously for all the developing countries which need access to these. Yeah, and that very neatly gets me on to my next question, which is, you know, if you took out your crystal ball, if you gaze into the future a little bit and tell us how the next 6, 12, 18 months may look, are we getting to a point where it is increasingly likely that we will need to have booster jabs, new jabs to deal with different variants and different mutations, and it's, it becomes something of an annual ritual to get a COVID vaccine, and of course all of the logistical challenges that will come with that? So again, I, it's very difficult to predict the future, but I do believe that this may potentially go the flu way. You know, in flu, we need to take regular jabs every year and sometimes twice a year, depending on the strains of the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. I think because of the significant mutations that get to be seen on, uh, on the COVID uh, virus, I, I do believe that this can pot will potentially become an annual vaccination. Uh, or some sort of a, a booster kind of dose that may be required because we are seeing that the new variants are more transmittable and are more virulent uh, and they infect more people. So I think the nature of the, if the antibodies do come down over six months to nine months, then we definitely believe that a booster dose may be required. And I think a lot of companies are doing the development to make sure that this can be made part of the cocktail of, anti of the vaccine, like a flu virus vaccine that we take or something so that it can be easily administered on an ongoing basis. Obviously, it's a choice that everybody makes, uh, but it's a choice that we should make available. Yes, absolutely. And it certainly seems that uh, it is getting that way, doesn't it, as far as the number of vaccines we may need to take each year, certainly in the UK, thinking about that third booster jab now for um, older residents of the country. Uh, Dr. Sharval, it's great to have you with us at India Global Forum. That's Dr. Sharval Patel there, the managing director of Zydus Group. Uh, Edie is going to be back after a very short break for the first of our panel sessions of this, day two of the forum, uh, looking at some of the issues that were raised in those conversations we've been having so far this morning. So Edie will be back straight after this break. We'll see you very soon. Mm -hmm.